Uh, I'll cover a bit about data access applications, what you want to think about when you're doing it. Most of this is going to be a reiteration of what's been said before, so hopefully it'll be quite speedy. And then I'll talk about what safe havens are and what to expect when you're using them. And I'll quickly jump through the linkage process, although Kathy covered that as well, so you know, it's worked so well. Um, just briefly, these are lots of data providers. They're the main hit hitters for your um, administrative data, and all of them will need data access applications. It might be in a formal capacity, it might be a little bit less formal. Um, but anywhere that collects data is a data controller. And these are just some of the ones. Some of them are centers that we've talked about before. They may hold lots of different ones, or they may help you get data and get data from lots of places. Some of them are just very simple, and we have this data, we might share it with you. But the most important thing to remember is to talk to people as early as possible. You can talk to me or Miriam or data controllers themselves. There's people whose job it is to help you do this research. So just talk to them. Bring them up with your random questions. Um, and we help you all the way through from like the beginning of your idea to all the way to actually getting the data and you cleaning it and finishing up and publishing, in fact. Uh, so when you think about data access applications, there's two things that sort of the point of data access applications is to cover the Data Protection Act that we've talked about a lot. And it's also to help the data extraction. So that's why they're quite detailed and quite interesting. So a lot of places have a, a specific access process. Do these three things, we will give you access to your data. Show these three things. Other places are a little bit less clear. Maybe they've never been asked for data before, maybe, or specifically for research purposes anyway. We've talked about how that can lead you down some strange roads and possibly talk to anyone but me because I don't know who the data custodian is. Just be prepared for it. Don't be too daunted. There's lots of forms. You can copy and paste between them. Uh, so I would advise that you do some research. We've talked about some places do publish data dictionaries. ISD, which is the health um, controller in Scotland, they publish. Um, or you can do direct contact to data controllers. Just because something is published in a data dictionary, as we talked about, doesn't necessarily mean it's any good or that you can have it. It's just there as a list of what you can have. Uh, another thing to think about is ethics before you start. Almost all panels will say, have you, had a, have you had ethical approval or have you thought about ethics? Some places when you're using maybe pre-collected data, admin data, some ethics panels will say that you don't need ethics approval. And generally, data access control, data controllers will accept that, but you have to prove that you've tried, that you've considered the, the ethical applications of your work. Um, so just talk to people. Find, the, find things out. We're around. Uh, the things you want to cover, this, again, is kind of similar to the Data Protection Act. So you, the public good and scientific advancement. Why is your project a good thing to do? Data controllers want to know that. Why, why should we give you your, us your data? Um, the next two, privacy and ethics, which is relating to data protection again, um, and public engagement, which we talked about a little bit. What's the public's view on why, why this might be a good or a bad thing in general? So what are the risks of those two points? A nice, pretty orange color. And the last one is how is your project design and methods. How is your project going to be conducted and who's going to be involved? Like Kathy said, list everyone who's going to be involved because we're going to ask again and again and again. So that's generally what you have to be clear about in your access application, what you want to cover, what you have to be clear about what you've considered. And then a little bit more brass tacks, kind of what you want to think about, what you want to write in there. What do you actually need each data field for? You do have to ask, generally, a list of variables. Don't just chuck something in because you think, oh, it might be interesting. Let's just stick ethnicity in there. Like we talked about, that sensitive personal data, justify it. Say, well, there's theory that this will actually, um, that this will actually be affected by what we're talking about. There's logistical issues. Where are you going to keep it? How secure is it going to be? Data controllers, we talked about that. There's culture of caution. So. Reassure them. Say, it's going to be in a secure location. Only these people can access it. We will keep it for this specific length of time. We'll only answer these questions. If you're going to use a safe haven, that would be great. Um, oh, and linkage, sorry. 
linkage, uh, when you, is how will the linkage actually happen? Is it even feasible based on the data sets that you've got if you're linking two things together? Maybe at a geographical level, does one only go down to local authority level and the other one goes all the way down to output area? You're, you're only going to be able to link at that local area level. If you're doing individual level data, when we talked about the education data and things, do you have enough variables to actually link on? Do you have, your, you basically need forename, surname, date of birth, gender, postcode. Those are the, the golden five. Um, if you don't have them, how are you going to get around that? Uh, when you're writing these things, you want to be detailed but not too technical. This is relating to who's going to be on these panels. Generally, on the panel, there are people who know about the data that they've got. It's generally a statsy type person, and there is almost always lay members. So don't go too nuts on the technical language. Oh, and this is the detail bit. They want to know you've considered the methods you're going to use, and potentially, if, for example, the looked after children data. Are you going to, when you compare them to um, other school aged children, is that going to be a match control sample, or is it going to be just everybody? They want to know that sort of thing because if you're going to use match controls, you're going to need, they're going to give you more data. Um, so they want to know the methods that you're going to, don't just write statistical methods will be used. <laughs> um, but they don't want to go too, don't go down to power calculations, but it just shows that you've really, really thought your project through. And don't assume a panel will know about all of the data, especially if you're linking things. The health panel don't know what the educational surveys are and vice versa. They might not even know about every single piece of data that they collect. So it shows that you've thought things through and this again, kind of all of these things are about the second part of data, the second purpose of data access applications, which is how to get the extract out. And then you get, might get it granted. <laughs> no brands, but pretty pictures. Is there any questions about that at all? Should I do it at the end? We'll do it at the end. So one of the outcomes it, once you have your data is it might be put into a safe haven. There are several safe havens around the UK. And they are a secure virtual repository with restricted access and high levels of security. It's basically a massive parallel computing center that you will have a virtual kind of window into. You might have to go to a specific place, go on site. The National Safe Haven is in Edinburgh. There's uh, another one in Essex for um, ONS data. Or you might have remote access. It depends on what data you have like how secure it needs to be, and the center that you're working with, the ADRN, you have to come to us. UBDC, we're working on doing more remote access. What happens when you will get a log on and a, there will be a secure password sent to you? You get access to a single study area and just your data. Um, there will be some statistical software, basic office programs. There's no internet. Don't think you can go Googling stuff. Um, you can ask for other software. For example, at the National Safe Haven, we don't currently have mapping software on there. But if you bring your own license, then yes, we can put it in there for you. But it's things that you're, like that that you'll need to think about as you're going along. You as a researcher, you can't put anything in or out. You have to go through someone like me, because we have to clear it to show that it's part of the, um, the data protection where if you link it to other data, what else can you learn about this person, identifying things. So you can't copy and paste in or out. Things about coding, where oh, this bit of code really is really good at clearing up this variable, it has to go through someone like me. Don't just come along with a disk in your pocket. It's kind of old-fashioned, isn't it? Don't come, don't email it in, or do email it in. <laughs> um, but you will. You'll have access to it. Single area. You'll do your research, and all of your outputs are then scrutinised with statistical disclosure control again by someone like me, so that there's no identifying things coming out of the safe haven, either way. It might. Well, depending on the data controller, they might want to do disclosure control as well. Everyone has different levels. Maybe the suppression numbers are different. Census is 10 and below. Other places are 5 and below. Just be aware of what is going to come out. Um, I just quite like this slide because <laughs> it shows that these are the sorts of things that you'll have to be thinking about before it goes into the safe haven. Um, you need funding. You'll have your proposal ready, the ethics training, data permissions, which includes data sharing agreements. Don't expect them to happen in any linear order. <laughs> They'll come in and out as a, uh, whenever you can, but then they'll end up either with a safe haven uh, or with you in its secure area with your data. Um, and then quickly, I thought I would go through the linkage process, although, as I said, Kathy's done it already. Mine's just pretty. 
you have data controller one, data controller two, who will send personal identifiers such as name, um, date of birth, I went through these, to a third party indexing. Um, and they will sit there and they will, and all that gets sent, yeah, like I said, all I get sent is the personal identifiers, not, nothing of interest. One, one. And then the third party indexing says, hey, that John Smith in data set one is also the John Smith in data set two. It might be that they're matching them to another third uh, one source of truth, but they match them together. It's done in different ways, but that's how it works. And then they get indexed, they get given different numbers. And then the third party indexing team keeps a master key saying, hey, number one is number nine and is also number 12. The index numbers get sent back to the data controllers separately. So the, you're number one, you're number 12. And they send the master index key to the safe haven, which is, as I said, parallel computing center to a linkage agent separately there. The data controllers can then put take off the personal identifiers, leave the index numbers on, and put the interesting bit on, the bit that says, this person broke their leg on the 6th of June, and then this person failed their English exam the next week, for example. They send them to the linkage agent, which puts them together, and puts them into the researcher study area, where you get to research it, and you're a happy person. <laughs> it's just meant to make it clear that it's a separation of functions. No one sees anything altogether. I can't reiterate it enough. Just talk to as many people as you can as early as you can. This is a fairly new area, really. And so the few people that do have some knowledge are willing to help and share as much as possible.